Okay, so the webinar today will look at introducing business and climate change and looking at the reciprocal relationship. Um, as Rob said, I'm Ian Harris. On this particular webinar, we'll also be joined by Ian Birchmore and by Tim Gillison. Uh, Professor Andrew Thomas sends his apologies. He's been called into a strategy meeting with the executive. Um, if you've got any queries associated with this presentation at all, please use the contact details at the bottom, ABS hash, sorry, dash inquiries at aba.ac.uk. Um, <clears throat> and similarly, on following slides, you'll see that this is part of a, a digital initiative that the, the Business School in Aberystwyth does to support sort of A-level development and, and just widening the sort of understanding of, of how business interacts with society. So the contents today really will we'll look at, I'll spend about five, six minutes on background evidence, then I'll pass you over to Ian Birchmore, who will look at business ethics. Uh, at the end of the business ethics, there'll be a quick poll where you can put your opinions on certain questions associated with the content that's just being covered. Um, we'll then go on to Tim. Tim will look at vertical business system, looking at the supply chain. And then I'll, I'll finish off with about 10 minutes talking about uh, brands and something called corporate social responsibility or sustainable marketing as it's now being called. Uh, the link at the bottom of these slides is, is a link to uh, register on the ABS business lectures, uh, which are designed for level three, A level, AS and um, equivalents. So realistically, um, climate change is a societal problem. And what we know is that business is a con constituent part of society. And if you look in the bottom right hand side of this slide at the minute, what you'll see is surface air temperature in the world. And as it goes towards orange, red and very dark brown, the air temperature is considerably warming. Uh, I'll try and stop it at around 20 2015-ish. Um, but this is fundamentally a problem of developed countries. And you can see here that we've got this much darker sort of resonant colours associated. So, and this is all delivered fundamentally by, by the concept of consumption. Uh, pretty much everything that's driving this is, is because we consume and we'll see what we consume. So developed nations seem to be causing this issue, uh, but the impact is, is particularly resonant, especially in Africa and Asia moving forward. That's where sea level change and, and changes in the environment will have fundamental impact as we see as we move on. So this is why the Paris Climate Accord was introduced in 2016 to try and stop this huge blanket of red. So how exactly does, does this take place? Well, this is two charts basically. Um, I believe these are from The Economist. Uh, we can see that over time, uh, carbon dioxide emissions are increasing. And, and in the top left hand part of this slide, we can see that oil, coal and gas are all contributors with a predominant growth in in gas more recently. But interestingly, if you take a look at the, the Chinese sort of angle, this angle here, you will see that their growth has been rather significant. And if you look at Europe, Europe's plateauing out because of initiatives large, launched before the end of the last century. The chart to the left is fascinating. It basically says that China produces about 30% of all emissions from fossil fuel com combustion. And a slide that we're gonna see soon is going to show that that's actually going to be amplified further. That's partly because countries like China don't have any in incipient energy sources apart from low grade subbituminous coal and lignite. So therefore they burn a lot of coal and by definition generate a great deal of carbon dioxide. So realistically, the temperature of the earth has been a roughly average 15 degrees. They believe if we move over 15, what, if we go 1.5 degrees centigrade above that number, then there will be a significant problem. 20 of the warmest, the 20 warmest years on record in the world have occurred in the last 22 years. And the reason that we care about this is because we know that there'll be worse storms, there'll be increased degradation of the environment. We're gonna have a population of about 9 billion in about 20 years time. So that's less land, less food, and food and water security becomes a much more fundamental driver. So governments are gonna start getting involved in these particular areas. This last little slide here, uh, and this is the point I was making, if you look at column four on the country, this is uh, developing resources and we can see that China in, 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 intends to generate a great deal more um, carbon dioxide as a direct result of megawatt production of energy. 
So what sort of greenhouse gases are we dealing with? Well, fundamentally it's carbon dioxide and, and methane. Um, methane's particularly problematic, as are the F gases, but carbon dioxide is, is the big one. And principally that comes from fossil fuel industrial processes. You've probably seen on the news about the impact that COVID's had on the environment and that seas are greener and, and cities are smog free. That's basically some of these, these F gases, methane and carbon dioxide, creating these photochemical smogs that are endemic in any sort of industrialised area. And then if we look at where uh, we use this energy, we can see that's a fairly broad representation. But if you imagine how you will, how you consume life, electricity, heat production, well, of course, in the winter you need it, in the summer, of course, you need it. Uh, transportation, how exactly do you get to and from your work or your school? Industry, how do you generate the things that you want? And where do you live? Um, the building. So we can see that there are all sorts of um, causes for this. Now, this is a fundamentally interesting um, slide and this is point out here because it basically shows that we can generate lower impacts so even though beef for example is particularly degradate degrading uh, because cows burp a lot and a lot of methane is released through burps um, you can actually do it in a much more low impact area so this is a really nice piece of work from Paul and Nemechek in 2018 but the fundamental truth and the reason that we have meatless Mondays or we have people trying to move towards a vegan or vegetarian diet is that the bottom line a portion of the highest impact vegetable proteins emits less than the lowest impact animal proteins and that's a key constituent if you've got nine billion people living in the world um, if you're not going to eat insects then realistically you're going to be moving more to so why is this a problem well up until about the 50s most of the carbon dioxide for example that we were generating would be sunk in in land or actually in ocean. So land-based CO2 sinks would be any vegetation. Uh, Ocean-based, basically the phytoplankton in the ocean is very good for trapping carbon to actually take it out of the system. So what we have now is this 45% increase in long-term atmospheric. And it's basically just like wrapping some insulation around, around your house or you putting an extra thick um, coat on in the winter. That's all that's happening. It's just stopping uh, radiated heat from escaping from the environment. So what I think, I think these, this has been distributed. Uh, what I'd like to do now is for you to ask, access the poll and just ask some three questions on this poll. Um, so if you do that, I'll give you two minutes. Uh, you can take a look at the poll. Please fill your answers in if you've got access to it. And then we'll discuss off the back of that. So just for everyone, that's now appeared that link on uh, the chat and it will also appear on Facebook Live. So if you could uh, complete that poll, that would be excellent. So if you've been successful, what you should have here is these three questions. Um, do you believe that the pandemic will have a beneficial impact on climate change? Do you believe that your school, college or workplace is sufficiently green? And will carbon footprint and environmental credentials be important for you in your choice of a university? If there are any questions at the minute, Rob, that people want to ask, we've got about 30 seconds left. Yeah, I think, you know, if there are any questions, please do put them on the chat or open up the microphone. Um, I think if you're a teacher as well, uh, and the, the bit about the choice of university, maybe you could answer that in respect to whether you think it's important or not. But any question, yeah, do put them on the chat or open up the mic. Okay, so let's take a look at some of these responses. I'm assuming that everybody can see this screen. Um, so this is live updated information. There's 35 responses at the minute. Uh, we can say, do you think the COVID-19 pandemic will have a beneficial impact on climate change? Yes, 32, no, four. Um, Ian, um, that's you're, not, you're showing your slides at the moment, so you'll need to ah, pan across. Sorry. I'll stop sharing and then start sharing again with a different Perfect. 
yeah it'll come through then yeah can you see that now yeah is that okay yeah. sorry um so we've now got 36 responses uh 32 believe that the pandemic will have a beneficial impact well um at the minute we're certainly seeing a beneficial impact we're seeing that micro and macro environmental changes are as occurring the bottom line with that is we've got this profound impact on our gdp our gross domestic product uh, and that impact is is going to have quite significant economic results now what you probably don't know is the type of drop that we've had for this COVID-19 pandemic is exactly the type of drop we would anticipate having every year for until the 2015 deadline of the Paris Climate Accord. So we would have to be doing what we've done this year as a result of, of, a, of an infection every year as a result to try and gain that. So up until 2019, we were nowhere near hitting the, the requirements. Do you believe that your school is or college is sufficiently green. Um, that's, I think that's a very fair result. You know, if I look around at, at my environment and my working environment, I can recognize that there are areas which could easily be made more sustainable or environmental. Now, the last point is fascinating. Will carbon footprint and environmental credentials be important for you in your choice of uni? And that's pretty much split straight down the middle. And what you'll see as you start looking for universities to study at, or when you've actually considered them, is that certain universities make a strong impact. They, they position themselves very strongly as a result of being environmentally credential. Um, as in uh, environmentally astute and managing their environment properly. So, for example, Aber Uni um, only it only uses sustainable electricity, and you can imagine that there's there's almost 2,000 staff in the place and thousands and thousands of students. There are quite a lot of electricity is being being used. Okay, any questions, Rob? Not at this stage, but I will encourage any Good. students just to, or anyone connected, just to put questions on the chat just while uh, each of the speakers are going through their, their sections. But, uh, but yeah, back to you, Ian. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to introduce Ian Birchmore. I believe that I will be forwarding the slides for Ian. Um, so Ian, you're on your ethical decisions introduction page. Um, Hello everybody, I'm Ian Birchmore, I'm a lecturer in accounting and finance and senior tutor in the business school at Aberystwyth University. Next slide. I'm going to be talking about decision making at the top of organisations. Organisations don't thrive and succeed by chance. That requires important decisions to be made so that they positively succeed. Decisions about what are our objectives, what are we trying to achieve, what is it that success is going to look like, how are we going to recognise that we're being successful, and then they need to make decisions about the processes they're going to put in place to achieve those objectives, to be successful, and they also need to address the question of whose interest they're seeking to serve. These the structures for making these decisions and then implementing them are at the heart of what we call corporate governance. Next slide. Good starting point for understanding corporate governance is a definition that we were given by the Cadbury Committee in the UK back in the early 1990s, which is that corporate governance is the system by which companies are directed and controlled. Within the UK, there's a key source of guidance on corporate governance for large companies. It's the UK Corporate Governance Code. The current version is the 2018 code. The code, in essence, is a set of principles and then more detailed provisions. Not surprisingly, the most important principles in many ways are the first two, principle A, principle B. Principle A tells us a successful company is led by an effective and entrepreneurial board whose role is to promote the long-term sustainable success of the company, generating value for shareholders and contributing to wider society. Let's just go back through that for a minute. A successful company is led by an effective board whose role is to promote the long-term sustainable success. 
very much turning away from any short-termist perspectives. And to do so, to generate value for shareholders and to contribute to wider society. Principle B then expands that. The key part of that, the board should establish the company's purpose, values, and strategy. All directors must act with integrity, lead by example, and promote the desired culture. In essence, issues of ethics, issues of values, defining how the organization operates, its culture, how it goes about doing business, and integrity at the top of the organization are clearly established as being of paramount importance. Next slide. From this, we start thinking about this concept of business ethics. Ac academics have long debated a precise definition of business ethics, but actually that doesn't matter very much. A bit like the proverbial e elephant, we understand it, we see it when it's in front of us, when we're talking about it. In essence, business ethics are about the way in which people in business behave and their values and the way in which they cause the businesses within which they work to behave and their values. It's about what's right and wrong, what's fair, what's honest, which of course means that in the end, business is about, business ethics are about people. And that gets us into the concept of a stakeholder. Freeman, in 1984, gave us a superb definition of a stakeholder. A Freeman, a stakeholder, is any group or individual who can affect or is affected by the achievement of the organization's objectives. In essence, a stakeholder is anyone who's got a significant interest in the way in which the organization goes about doing business. Which must mean that there's some examples of stakeholders, the shareholders, the managers, the customers, the suppliers, and many others are important stakeholders. And if we then stop and think about it a bit more deeply, we can see that as long as we don't get hung up on a stakeholder having to be human, the climate must be an important stakeholder of a business. It can affect and is affected by the achievement of the organization's objectives. We don't need to think any further than BP and the Gulf oil spill of a few years ago to be persuaded of the power of that argument. Next slide. So, on that, coming back to this question of corporate success, one key question then arises. Success must be about meeting the needs and expectations of others. But who are those others? Is it just the shareholders? Is it just about meeting the economic needs and expectations of the owners of the business? Or is it about meeting the needs and expectations of a wider set of stakeholders, perhaps the customers and the employees and the suppliers? Or is it about meeting the needs and expectations of wider society, society as a whole? Perhaps we need to take one step beyond that and embrace the needs and expectations, I mean the needs of the environment, of the climate. This is an issue that academic researchers have been looking at for a number of years now. Key paper in this area, Joyner and Payne, they tell us that this isn't a mutually exclusive competition. It isn't the case that meeting the needs of one group must be to the detriment of the needs of the others. Actually, the research is indicating that it's very much the reverse. And the research is also telling us that firms that are judged to behave responsibly overall tend to do better in the longer term. It tends to make a very strong contribution to that long-term sustainable success. Principle A of the UK Corporate Governance Code sets as the key priority for the board leading a successful company. Next slide. Further to that, additional research tells us that there's a very clear positive link between what we might call social performance, meeting the needs and expectations beyond those of the bound, narrow boundaries of the organization, and financial success. 
Joiner and Payne again. Joiner and Payne tell us that companies have a choice as to the extent to which they will or will not seek to, com to comply and exceed legal obligations. They tell us that those companies that seek to be responsible and act beyond just meet minimum compliance with legal obligations tend to build up a bank of goodwill so that when they hit problems, when perhaps a crisis arrives, and every now and then all organizations hit serious problems, that bank of goodwill tends to see them through that crisis because they're given the benefit of the doubt by their stakeholders. Those organizations that have been seen not to do that, just to do the legal minimum, tend not to have that bank of goodwill and are much more likely to fail when that problem, serious problem, when that crisis arises. Next slide. So putting all of that together, we see that over the last few years, the definition and sense of corporate governance has changed and developed. And increasingly, it's seen as embracing meeting the needs and expectations, the legitimate needs and expectations of a wider set of stakeholders. And in the context of everything we're talking about today, that then invites a critical question. Should this include the climate? The implications of everything I've been saying are that the answer to that must be yes. And if it is yes, that then sets a demanding question for those leading companies. How can and should we, how should, can and should companies as a whole seek to address the needs of the climate? That's a question I'll leave you with to ponder after today. Next slide. So can I ask you again for the second time to have a, have a look at those two poll questions and then we'll come back to those results. Can, just uh, before that, um, Tim, is it, is it, sorry, Ian, is it possible to uh, just respond to a question from VL? Um, so VL is asking, do businesses have the duty to act ethically um, as it is in the best interest of everyone if they did so based on utilitarian principles? That's a fascinating question. Um, there's a, a clip, a structured answer. There's clearly a, a legal, a, a duty to act ethically to the extent that those ethical principles are enshrined in national law. Beyond that, there's an expectation to complying with the principles of the UK Corporate Governance Code that companies will go beyond that. And increasingly, there are expectations from stakeholders, expectations from wider society that they will do just that. In terms of the utilitarian perspective, the research evidence is telling us that there is a, a two forms of payback. One is the greater sustainability of the organization, enhanced financial performance for those organizations that are judged to behave ethically, to behave responsibly. So I think a m multiple answers boiling down to yes, partly as a matter of legal obligation, partly as a matter of expectation in terms of corporate governance regulation, and perhaps most powerfully in terms of increasing societal expectations. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Ian, for that. Um, we, we've got various questions coming on. I might just ask, um, yeah, uh, at some point, Ian Harris, if you're able to respond to Claire's uh, question about uh, an earlier slide uh, on chat, but I know that you're sharing your screen at the moment, so but we'll come to that. Uh, VL's just said thank you. We've got a really good uh, discussion going on on Facebook regarding COVID as well, and maybe we can come to that at the appropriate time. Uh, but uh, we'll put the post up for you now, Ian. Uh, so if everyone can go to that link and respond to that poll.
Okay, so we're starting to get the results through, Ian. Um, so we've got 23 responses so far. Um, the, for the first question, which of these do you think is the company's most important stakeholder? Um, the vast majority are saying the customers, so 17 out of the 29. Uh, we also have, coming second, we have the shareholders. Um, and third is the climate. So that's interesting. So, uh, and those, uh, as the numbers are updating, those patterns are um, consistent. And what is the board of directors' first responsibility? Um, so the vast majority there is all of the above. Um, so that's interesting. So uh, at least 20 of the 35 responses are saying all of the above. Uh, the highest number other than that is to make a profit, um, closely followed by to protect the environment. So uh, there are the responses coming through, Ian. That, that's fascinating, isn't it? It's showing a number of things. Firstly, how complex the challenges facing the, the board of directors of a company actually are, trying to reconcile these com competing stakeholder claims and the attention and the prior and the priorities of the organization. And just the range of challenges there, the fact that the predominant answer to the second question is all of the above. Just think about the board of directors having to balance all of those competing priorities. And of course, we've only got in that poll a quick short list of po possible answers to that question. All of the above in reality is a much bigger list. So what we see from this is how fascinating and how important all of these issues are in business, and also how important these are as subjects for really serious academic study. Okay, so at which point I'll hand over to my colleague, Tim Gillison. Thank you, Ian, and we will go to you, Tim. Um, I just wanted to, just to keep the uh, audience in Facebook involved. Um, maybe I can put this to the whole of the uh, ABBA team, but Cameron was asking, do we think as a result of the COVID pandemic, the way we run our businesses will change for a prolonged amount of time, which as a result, will this aid the reduction in climate pollution? And Rebecca has actually responded to that on Facebook as well, and you might have some views on this, but uh, in the medium term, yes, with businesses not being able to operate as usual, However, if and when society is able to start functioning again, the country's main priority will be economic, and I think anything to do with the climate will be neglected in the political turmoil to follow, especially with Brexit. So uh, really interesting, uh, the question and response from Be Rebecca. So um, who would like to just sort of uh, say something uh, in response to that? Uh, Ian, maybe? I think I'll, I'll certainly... I would certainly add one thing to that. I, mean, I think what we've just heard makes a very great deal of sense and is somewhat compelling. I think one issue that certainly emerges from this is a key issue in corporate governance, the way organizations go about managing risk. And I think one of the things that we've seen from COVID-19 is also the pre pressing of the reset button on risk management. And it's going to be fascinating to see how that plays out. Great, thank you. Um, do you do, do you want to take more questions now, or would you like uh, us to save them for the moment? Because Cameron uh, is very active here with some questions about stakeholders, and Ross is uh, also asking questions about uh, products and their origins. Um, so, should, should we keep that to the end, or would you like to field some of them now? Um, Ian, as, as the, the other host, what would you like to do, Ian Harris? I think uh, it's no harm, is there, spend another minute or two on this particular area, let Ian then sort of cover it off rather than come back to it. Great stuff. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. So, Ros is saying all products originally come from the earth, i.e. ecosystem services. Therefore, businesses should seek to protect these services in order to, to protect themselves. So, that's a really interesting point. Uh, any thoughts on that one? I think there's two thoughts that immediately come to mind. One is the answers to the second poll question that jump out here, don't they, in terms of competing priorities, but certainly that should be in the list. And also going back to principle A of the UK Corporate Governance Code about the, the obligations on 
business leaders to focus on long-term sustainable success. This, the issues being raised here must be a significant element of those kind of contributors to long-term sustainable success. Thank you, Ian. And there's one question, really interesting uh, question from, and thank you, Ros, for that as well. But Cameron is asking, my question is that if the customer is seen as the most important stakeholder, how is the company funded as without the shareholders, the company cannot be taken into different markets and provided with investment? So that's a brilliant uh, question from Cameron. That's absolutely, um, that's one of the core difficult issues here. If we, again, go back to principle A of the UK Corporate Governance Code, that specifically talks about um, long-term sustainable success in the interest and the two stated groups. One is the shareholders and one is wider society. And I think we need to retain that reality check of the focus on the long-term sustainable success in the interest of the shareholders who fund the organization, but also to see that that isn't the whole picture. And that, as the research is telling us, one of the key ways, perhaps the key way of meeting those economic interests of the shareholders is to also embrace and be responsible as regards meeting the needs and expectations of other important stakeholder groups. It isn't a mutually exclusive competition. It's not a matter of look out for the stakeholders or look out for others. Actually, responsible business seeks to be responsive and responsible as regards that overall set of interests. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Ian. And thank you, Ian Harris, for your response to Claire as well. Um, so, Claire, you'll find a response from Ian on the chat. Um, let's go across to Tim then. I think you're talking about business integration. So over to you, Tim. Hello. Well, uh, welcome to my part of the webinar. Um, I'm going to attempt to share some slides with you now, um, which are entitled, Have We Opened Pandora's Box? And I don't know how much you know of the story of Pandora, but she was given a gift, which actually in ancient translation turned out to be a container which had inside it a number of uh, a number of gifts, but also a number of curses. And having opened it and released the gifts, he released the curses. And of course, the story is they could never be put back in the box. I'm going to tell you a little story, um, which is about global logistics. And it involves me, first of all, giving you a quote from Dennis Munby, who was an economist a long time ago now, back in the 1970s. And he said, the cost of transport determines the size of production units, the size of cities, and hence the human opportunities for leisure, choice of jobs, and the quality of life in general. And it's the cost of transport bit that I want you to bear in mind, because that's what I'm actually going to talk about. You may not realize this to begin with, but that is the thrust of what I want to talk about here. If we look back, well, most of you can't, of course, but I can look back to the 20th century, and I can often ask students in lectures, what do you think was the greatest innovation of the 20th century? Almost inevitably, the internet is mentioned, and clearly that is a rightful contender for that title. It enables, in the context of business, global trade to be conducted quickly, efficiently, effective, effectively, and of course, cheaply and almost immediately. But it doesn't actually deliver anything. Yes, it'll stream movies, it allows communication, it transfers information, but it doesn't physically deliver anything. And there's a second innovation, which actually was conceived around the same time that I was, um, which was developed in the second half of the last century, which provides the ability to deliver on a global scale. To show you just how important that is, I need to take you back to the pre-containerization era when shipping looked like this. Lots of people involved, these are dockers, stevedores, if you want to call them that, ships were relatively small and goods were handled, well they were literally handled loose as in a loose form. These are bales of wood pulp, these clearly are bananas. These photographs were taken in the port of Preston. Um, the reason I use that example is that was where I was brought up and my father was the chief civil engineer for that port. So I've seen some of this firsthand. I know these guys ate an awful lot of bananas. They weren't supposed to, 
but that was what they were handling and of course a few would occasionally fall off these bunches occasional cases of whiskey would get broken there was a lot of leakage but more to the point there was an awful lot of time involved a ship would be in port for two to three weeks while it was loaded and unloaded and in america there was a character with the name of malcolm mclean who ran a trucking company and he was getting very frustrated by the amount of time that his lorries would spend in port being loaded and unloaded in the fashion that i've just shown you and he came up with the mind-numbingly simple idea of why don't we just put everything in a box that fits on the back of the lorry and then instead of getting it out of the box we put the box on the ship in other words a container he conceived of the idea of containerization and this vessel which we see here the ideal x is a converted type 2 oil tanker and it was the very first shipping the very first container vessel that we ever had its maiden voyage was from port newark new jersey to houston texas and it carried 58 remember the number 58 sealand containers that was back in 1956 a little while after that this is the first container vessel that berthed in preston again it's pretty small and it's being unloaded by a conventional quayside crane so what you're thinking this is what quayside cranes look like now they're specialist beasts that have evolved to a specific task which is moving boxes off ships onto the shore and vice versa one of these can move 650 containers in a 12-hour shift 54 per hour between ship and shore we've got all sorts of technologies for moving these boxes around huge machines that can move them in a, almost as little time as it takes to say the evolution in this has been startling rapid and most importantly global this is a photograph of the port of rotterdam which is one of the biggest i think it is the biggest european port it's one of the world's smartest ports these cranes are robotized there's no driver anywhere there's somebody in a control room somewhere monitoring about 20 of them per person but they are completely automatic they can pick containers up with a thing called a spreader which locks on with no human intervention whatsoever they can deposit on the key or more to the point on one of these robotized automated electric guided vehicles no diesel trucks cavorting around on the key site electric vehicles with no driver with clean energy and superbly efficient they're guided by computer um, algorithms that minimize the amount of distance they have to travel and so on this is a superbly efficient global system if you know anything about how the internet works this is remarkably similar to the internet it works because of standards it works because every one of these boxes satisfies an iso standard so it can be handled by equipment anywhere on the planet be that a lorry a crane all of the stuff that we have on ports it's standard just in the way that data packets and the internet are standardized if you don't know what i'm talking about there don't worry about it but if you've done any computer science you'll know that the reason the internet works is you can plug absolutely anything into it this is a physical version of the internet it doesn't matter what's in the box it's like a data packet it can be moved anywhere on the world on the globe it's intermodal they can be moved by road rail ship or barge it's multi-purpose you can put whatever you like in it it's sealed so it can pass through customs without being opened and inspected because it has a customs seal on the lock and it's reusable it can be used as i say for many many things those are general boxes there with all sorts of uh, things in we'll come on to what later there's one that's been modified to carry a small uh, a small boat an open topped one with huge tires in one with a, uh, a tank inside it but the outside dimensions are the same so it's a container this is really special this is a reefer container it has a refrigeration unit in the end here which is powered by electricity which can be powered from the ship from the quay from a lorry which is transporting it that is a 40 foot deep freeze or a fridge or whatever you want it to be though so you could load frozen prawns into that in new zealand and it could travel all the way around the world to the uk to europe just like a mobile deep freeze these days you can monitor them um, by satellite link a data link from the container that will tell you what the temperature is inside it where it is and so on so this system can transport virtually anything it's evolved over 50 years well more than 50 years now this tiny little speck at the top here is one of the early container ships the encounter bay that could carry 
one and a half thousand shipping containers. Do you remember I said the first vessel carried 58? That can carry one and a half thousand. Well, I say one and a half thousand, they're TEUs, 20 foot equivalent units. Most shipping containers are actually 40 feet long, but we started with 20, so we measure them as 20 foot equivalent units. I can see Ian looking at his watch now, probably panicking, thinking, I wonder what he's going to say next. Um, this is how ships have grown over the years. 2018, we have vessels that can carry 22,000 20 foot equivalent units. What I'm going to talk about in a minute is this one, which is a triple E class vessel that can carry 18,000. If you unloaded those and put them on lorries, that would make a nose to tail traffic jam 70 miles long. This may not mean anything much to you, but here in Aberystwyth, that would stretch all the way from Aberystwyth to Shrewsbury. One shipload of containers, nose to tail, 70 miles. So this is pretty big. But, but, there's a big but here. Maritime transport, in other words, ocean shipping, emits about 940 million tonnes of CO2 annually and is responsible for 2.5% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Well, if you bear in mind that transport generally accounts for 14%, 2.5% is a pretty big chunk of transportation emissions. And these emissions are projected to increase significantly if we just carry on as things are. According to the third International Maritime Organization greenhouse gas um, study, shipping emissions could under a business as usual scenario, increase between 50 and 250 percent by 2050, which completely undermines the objectives of the Paris Agreement. And there are links there to both of those um, studies if you want to see them. Shipping companies are aware of this, and here is an attempt to address it. A triple E cl class container ship um, commissioned and built by Maersk. Maersk is one of the biggest companies on the planet that you will never have heard of. You'll have seen the name because it's written on the side of 40 foot containers that truck up and down the motorways, but you'll probably never have seen any of these things. These ply the oceans 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year, delivering all the things that we like to buy in the shops. And we'll come on to what those are in a minute. Why triple E? Economy of scale, energy efficient and environmentally improved. You could ask the question, going back perhaps to what Ian Birchmore was talking about, is why are they doing this? Is it because it's energy efficient which makes it more economical for them to run, or is it really because it's environmentally approved? The two things tend to go hand in hand, because environmental considerations are very often very closely linked to fuel consumption. These vessels are designed to reduce fuel consumption as much as possible. We've talked about the capacity here, here is how big it is, 400 metres long, nearly 60 metres wide, and it requires nearly 15 metres depth of water. That's pretty big. Um, I won't go into what it compares to now, but you can work that out for yourself. It has two 43,000 horsepower engines. That's relatively small by maritime standards because it's aimed at efficiency. It has a maximum speed of 25 knots. Uh, that's nearly 30 miles an hour, but it's designed to sail at 19 knots. We use this term slow steaming because with, as with any vehicle, fuel consumption goes up exponentially with speed. So if you can sail slower, you use less fuel. The whole hull design is optimized for lower speed. And this design reduces fuel consumption by 37%, they claim, which they say saves 4,000 tons of fuel sailing between Europe and Singapore. You've got to get your head around how much fuel these things use. They achieve the equivalent of 30 feet per gallon. If you want to look at it in terms of fuel consumption, they will move just under 30 feet, propelled by one gallon of fuel. But of course, oh, that picture's there because I like the scale of it. It might give you an idea of just what we're talking about here. Here is one of these ships, 300 meters long. Here is a container park. Each one of those 40 foot containers is, equi is the equivalent of an articulated lorry. Look how tightly they're packed on board that vessel. There's an important bit here. This is an infographic, which I can't possibly go into in great detail. Ian will be relieved to know. Um, but there's an important bit in the middle here. Greener transport. This is a representation of the grams of CO2 to transport one tonne of goods one kilometre. By air freight, that's 560 grams. By truck, it's 46. By rail, it's 18. By triple E, it's three grams. 
that's kind of nice isn't it because that looks so good compared with air freight and trucks but there's an awful lot of tons and an awful lot of miles involved in the use of these ships that's how far they go from the far east to europe and they go backwards and forwards backwards and forwards it takes them about three weeks to do that and they are constantly doing that day and night we'll talk about the downside of that in a minute but why does this actually matter i started off mentioning shipping costs i happen to have a tz60 camera the specification doesn't matter but just as a matter of interest i worked out how many you could get into a 40 foot container and it's nearly 40,000. When I looked, the shipping cost for a 40 foot container from China to the UK, well, not to the UK, to Europe, was $800. That means, work it out per camera, it's two cents, two pence, doesn't really matter what you call it, it's virtually zero. The list price of the camera is £350. Even if you change the shipping cost by an order of magnitude, if it goes up to $8,000, which it never does, but even if it did, that's 20 cents, 20 pence. It's nothing. So we started off talking about, uh, about transport costs. This is a phenomenal reduction in transport costs. The implication of that is that it doesn't actually matter where we manufacture, because to get from manufacture to market costs almost nothing per unit. So this creates huge opportunities for international trade. It reduces in the West the cost of foreign goods. It allows the distribution of manufacturing. And we are totally hooked on that. So much of what we buy is made in China, in countries in that area, at a vastly reduced cost, that if anybody took this away, if anybody said, no, we're not going to do that anymore, then in my view, there'd be almost a riot because we have got so addicted to cheap goods it's allowed the development of industry in the east we talked earlier on or somebody talked earlier on about the huge greenhouse gas emissions from china they wouldn't be doing a lot of that if they weren't able to market their physical products over to the west so this is a double whammy in the sense that the transportation produces huge amounts of greenhouse gases but it also enables people who are not regulated as closely as we are to produce on a huge scale tangible products but in ways which we wouldn't want to it gives the proliferation of jobs but if you want to look at the ethics of it under what conditions that's why so many of our clothing items are made in countries in the far east i keep saying the far east it's i think we know where we're talking about there's lots and lots of areas where labor is dirt cheap it's given us a huge growth in global trade and in shipping so that's not just my opinion. I'll, I think there's a way of doing this. I haven't done it yet. I'll offer you some references which can be appended to um, this, wherever it gets published. It's not just my opinion. People have written endless books about how containerization has almost, almost completely enabled global trade to be the way it is now. Without it, the world would be a terribly different place, which is why I pose the question, have we opened inadvertently Pandora's box? When McLean came up with this idea of putting boxes on trucks and ships, he had no idea where it would end. We weren't concerned about the environment back in those days. Yes, we were concerned, you know, if somebody dumped um, mercury compound insecticides into the river and so on, but carbon dioxide, what, how could that possibly be dangerous? We breathe it after all, you know, plants make food out of it. What, what's so dangerous about carbon dioxide? Why would we have even wondered about where this story was going to lead? So the question that I leave, leave with you is not really, you know, I'm not providing solutions. I'm saying in many respects, we've got ourselves into a very tricky situation here because in the West, we depend on these cheap goods. In the East, lots of jobs depend on be, being able to export them to us. But that process is environmentally very damaging. So really, I'm leaving you with a question, not an answer. What does the future hold for this ecosystem that we've got ourselves into? And yes, there's another poll here, which um, I would invite you to take part in. Um, I have no idea how I'm going to see the answer to that. So I'm going to ask Ian to sort that out. Um, but yeah, if you've got any questions, I would be more than happy to attempt to answer them. I'm going to stop sharing the screen now so that uh, you get the dubious pleasure of seeing me.
Um, oh no, we see Ian instead. But thank you, thank you, Tim. Um, yeah, we've shared the poll, so um, if you're able to respond to that, that would be great. And it ties in with uh, a comment from Roz, uh, or a question from Roz, uh, which we might address once the polls come through, because it relates to the pros and cons of containerization. Um, also, at the same time, Cameron is saying, my argument for it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter where you manufacture, um, would be that in places like China, the cost of the labor is cheaper, which would allow companies to produce their products for a lower price. It also depends on where it is cheapest to source the materials for production. So uh, there's some sort of comments from Cameron. I think an interesting rider to that though is, I mean, we're, we're talking about sustainability in a sense, and very often we're talking about that from an environmental point of view. Um, but you could ask the question, of course, how long could you keep doing this anyway? Because typically, we move manufacturing to where labour is cheap, the economy develops, and they then quite rightly think, why should, we work, why should we be working for such low rates? So the cheapness then diminishes over time, and you have to find somewhere else where labour is cheap. I would argue that actually this situation isn't sustainable from almost any point of view. Um, but of course, I'm old and gnarled, and it probably won't worry me in my lifetime, but that's not really the point, because a lot of you guys clearly are not, although I can see Ian on the screen here. <laughs> I love him really, you know. <laughs> ah. uh, Rob? I can't hear you. Yeah, Ian, could you just share those uh, results again? Of course. That's what we've got. Great. So, uh, yeah, looking at those then, what percentage of the goods consumed in the UK arrives by sea? So the vast majority there, um, I think that's, is that 80, um, Ian? You can correct me if, you, if I'm wrong. No, it's, um, it, it's 60. 60. And then who is affected by containerization? Again, the vast majority is almost everybody. Uh, you know, that, that's a very high percentage. Uh, is containerization a good thing? Uh, the majority are saying yes. Okay, can I can I comment on those at this point? Um, the... yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, obviously we've uh, got shorter time for uh, Ian yeah. in uh, your section, Ian. But oh, yeah, just, sorry, uh, well, maybe a quick comment. Well, would you rather leave that until the end, just in case? Uh, so maybe a short comment, and then we'll go to Ian. Okay, well, the answer to the first one, which is there is a categorical answer to that, is over 90%. Um, the reason I ask it is that a lot of people are totally unaware of just how important sea transport is. Yes, this one, clearly I would agree with, almost everybody is affected by it one way or another. The last question is a trick question because how can you actually say whether it's a good thing or a bad thing? It depends on your point of view, it depends where you are, who you are, Whatever, it's a, it, I asked that question because it's something you could debate for hours. Um, it's a technology, whether it's a good thing or not, depends on where you are, how you're affected by it, how it affects our planet and so on. So I'll shut up for now and uh, let Ian. Thank you, time. thank you, Tim. Um, we do have a question from Hake, um, but we will come to that at the end if we have time. And if not, the team from ABBA, I think we'll be looking at the Facebook and responding to that later as well. So uh, back to you, Ian. Okay, um, so I think I've got about five minutes, I'll give or take a little bit. I'll try and compress this in. Uh, realistically, marketing is the front end of the organisation. It's where we influence all the stakeholders that Ian uh, discussed and the consumers that, that Tim was basically basing his, his drive um, from. Basically, uh, businesses recognise that they needed to be seen to be corporately socially responsible. And they started seeing this from about the mid 80s through to the, the late 90s. And corporate social responsibility was an international voluntary code of, code of self-regulation. Um, more recently, international laws have moved it from being something that a, an organization could choose to do to being something that is a legal requirement of the, of the, of the, com of the company. And some introduced schemes that we see with this is like sugar tax. Uh, by the way, since the sugar tax was introduced, sugar consumption has gone up by about 1.6%. That's quite common when we get these mandatory schemes. Uh, Cox and Knox emissions targets. Um, we can see that uh, in 2015, 
uh, VW to try and capture more market share in America had defeat mechanisms on their cars which suggested that they were very clean but the reality was they were incredibly dirty. Now interestingly you'd imagine that that would have a huge impact on, uh, on Volkswagen Audi Group. Uh, the contrary has happened, they've actually grown since that point. Yes they've lost billions in, in legal uh, activities but they're actually selling more cars. So Regulation is normally reframed by marketers. What we do is we take a perspective and then we try to provide the best possible uh, view on that perspective. And this is really quite key um, because businesses fundamentally are driven by revenue generation and profitability. There are of course socially responsible businesses and those businesses that want to do some social good. Um, but typically we try to push position our ourselves as companies further. And the way that we do this is we frame. Uh, Shifuel and Tewksbury in 2007 just said, how do we present information in such a way that the audience assimilates it in a positive light towards us? How did VW overcome cheating 16 million vehicles across the world and causing a huge environmental scandal and still grow. And what they did is they framed, they reframed the situation. And what happens is this builds off a, a guy called Bernays, who came up with the concept of propaganda in the context of public relations. And all VW Audi Group did is they took some of these ideas that Bernays first started identifying to shape events, to influence relationships to publics, uh, and they've obviously done a very good job of it up until this recent uh, COVID inspired activity. Now this moves on, uh, ideally what we want to be is we want to be sustainable marketers. Um, what we want to do is we want to make sure that what we do is ecological, equitable and economic. And, and this actually maps into a concept that's been around in business since about the mid 90s called the triple bottom line. And the triple bottom line says we have to be fair to the planet, we have to be fair to the people and we have to be fair in making profit. And what marketing has done through the sustainable marketing component is they've said, OK, ecological equals planet, equitable equals people, economic equals profit. So what we're trying to do, again, you see a common thread coming through this, this, this business idea is that we're trying to meet existing generations needs. Now, the, the points that Tim and Ian Birchmore made is that some of these answers are very difficult to achieve. And what we try to do within the business school is we try to provide our students, the leaders of industry in the future, with perspectives on what they can and how they can do things. And this is the real value of undertaking a business degree. So we've already said marketing should be positively impactful to the environment should be equitable and obviously we need to be able to generate a profit otherwise we go into the business. And this isn't a new concept, this is the body shop, uh, mid 80s launched, taking some societal stands such as ban against animal testing, making sure that the supply chain were reimbursed effectively for their for supplying the goods and the services. It was owned, it was bought out from Anita Roddick in 2004, I believe, by L'Oreal. L'Oreal basically tried to make a cash cow out of it, couldn't make any more money out of it, sold it to Natura. Um, the concepts and the principles of body shop still exist. However, you might imagine that local competitors such as Lush are now sort of overcoming this, this stance and actually have a much more environmental and ecological framework. So much so that the body shop in, a, in about 18 months ago was using its premises as the, the founding grounds for people who wanted to do climate emergency uh, type activities. That's not the only one, Ben and Jerry's, you may have eaten it, um, originally created by a guy who had no sense of smell. Um, or taste, so he liked mouthfeel, um, and that's why he started putting chunks of things in his product because it actually he actually sent something. Um, basically, bought by Unilever in 2000. Now, the bottom line with this is if this is a, a clickable link, so if you want this, just contact ABS Inquiries, watch the video. They they position themselves as being a, a sustainable company, an environmentally responsible company and they do that and if you watch this video you'll see the different ways in which they position themselves to that. 
And we see activities such as this. What a great way to associate my brand with something which is allegedly environmentally fair, a Tesla. I don't think so. Making electric batteries is an incredibly destructive activity to do. Uh, but here we go. The, 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 the people, the consumers, the stakeholders recognize Tesla as being an environmentally um, sensible decision to make. So Unilever is going to get on board and actually make the point that, well, here we go. We'll just associate, tweak the Tesla for free ice cream and just pick up your free ice cream from there. I'm going to speed through this, unfortunately. Palm oil is used just about everywhere. Nestle, a company that you may be aware of, uh, Kit Kats, Milky Bar, Smarties, uh, vilified in 2015 because of their, should we say, unsustainable and ecologically unacceptable mechanisms to get uh, palm oil. If you take a look at the chart on the right, we've had a 40% increase in the production of palm oil in the world over the last seven years. Uh, that's significant because to increase that, we have to actually destroy natural habitats. Uh, this is a Greenpeace video, which please watch in your own time, um, which actually shows the environmental degradation. Now, Nestle were vilified for their use of palm oil. What you probably are not aware of is that in 2020, Nestle has a higher responsibility audit than Unilever for the use and the acceptable use of palm oil in their products. So even though Unilever are presenting themselves and positioning themselves as an organization which is very sort of environmentally conscious, the reality is that the press just hasn't caught up with the story. And because Nestle of the classical pantomime villains, because they sold milk formula to Africa in the 80s, leading to hundreds and thousands of additional deaths of, of local indigenous peoples, um, they end up carrying the can. There's more to this, but unfortunately, I think they're well out of time. So what we're going to do is we're just going to do a quick survey. So we set this concept of the triple bottom line planet, sustainable environmental practices, people, equitable employment terms, community, region. Think about people. Think about the gig economy. Are people really employed on equ equitable employment terms? I don't think so. They don't get holiday pay. They don't get sickness pay. Um, COVID has meant that they don't earn any money. They're self-employed, they don't earn enough, they don't even get any government support. Profit, how much, how much revenue do I need to create? For example, if we use the, the case of um, lift sharing, none of the lift sharing companies at the minute, such as Uber, uh, are making any money. They're making huge losses, billions of dollars of losses. Okay, so we've got a poll. The poll's fairly simple. This one's just gonna ask you three pretty basic questions. Um, I think that link should be shared. Is that correct, Rob? If you're still with us? Yeah, that's available. And they've had that for um, half a minute or so. So we should start seeing the results coming through. OK, so basically what I'm asking you to do here is I'm asking you to prioritize what you think is most important, people, profit or planet. And it's an extension of the question both Ian Birchmore and Tim Gillison asked you. How would you prioritize? Because the fundamental truth is, can you make them all your highest priority? Um, I'd like you to name what you believe your most uh, favorite sustainable company is. And then the final question really is, how sustainable are you or your family? So we'll just, I'll, what I'll do is I'll stop sharing the slide and I will start sharing the results. So these results are coming in. So do you want to just talk through those then, Ian? Of course, of course. So the fundamental issue here is that, you know, how do you become equitable for everybody? How do you make sure that the people surrounding this environment are looked after, that your profit is maintained at an acceptable level, and that the plan is also? And you can see from those results that the averages are fairly close. So it's very difficult for you as consumers to actually consume these goods and services to be able to sort of make a, a defunct decision, a default decision, in fact. Um, it's quite nice to see um, your favorite sustainable company. Um, I don't know if I've biased the, the statement by saying Lush in an earlier presentation. 
But you'll see there that there's quite a broad distribution, and this is the whole point. Companies try to position themselves as sustainable, but consumers can only remember so many companies and associate them with so many focal benefits, one of which would be that they are a sustainable company. And then the final question is, how sustainable are you and your family? And that's a, quite a reassuring statistic to see. Um, I would say, even though I act as sustainably as possible, that my lifestyle is unsustainable. Um, but more of you are moving towards the sustainable mechanism. So Rob, can I just have one more minute? Yep, yeah, sure. And then, yeah, have a minute and then we'll bring the session to a close at that point. But thank you. Really, thank you, sir. Yeah. So basically, this is just to make you aware, we, we have a, a very significant new entrant into the degree market, and that's this concept of, of business and economics with ch climate change within the business, um, within the business school, sorry. So the UCAS code is FN71. And if you want to find out any information on that, if you just look for FN71 as a UCAS code, you can read up on about how universities are recognising the impacts of business and climate change. At the minute, there's very few universities doing this. Um, what we'll see is that this environmental sustainability angle will become progressively more embedded. Thank you. Thank you so much to the team at um, Abris with that was really uh, enlightening and informative and hopefully that's really supported some of the students out there in lockdown. But thank you to everyone for taking part and we will um, close the session now.